<sighs> we um we have a couple of people that we want to hear from, including Rana. And then we'll circle back to Kevin and make sure that you got some information. But I do want to shout out to Kevin. Um, they had great coverage of um, Vote Early Day. Kevin, do you want to talk a little bit about that before Rana takes the mic? Yeah, um, we had uh, the local Chicago NBC affiliate come out to our uh, senior votes event. So we were trying to help seniors with ballots and things like that and just giving them information. There was a food and clothing drive going on at the church that we were headquartered at uh, for Saturday. So anytime they came in, we gave them um, Monica actually had some actual uh, reference books. They're like yellow pages for seniors so they can find out what is out there for them that they can, you know, get, you know, as far as services and, and goods like that, different discounts that they could get. And we uh, asked everybody if they have voted and stuff. And it was so funny that most of, almost everybody said, oh, I voted already. Yeah, we got to We got to get this done, you know. So that was really great. Um, I was outside and one of the janitors came up to me. He was like, hey, can I ask you about voting? He had walked past us a few times and I guess he felt like he was on the job. And he caught me out in the parking lot and I explained to him that he needs to get his uh, mail-in ba ballot in uh, if he was going to uh, not vote in person, but he was thinking that he was going to change over and vote in person. So that's what he was asking me. Can I trade it in and vote in person? I said, absolutely. I think that's better. So <laughs> a lot of people that I've, I've talked to have wanted to trade their ballot in and do it in person. Everyone's kind of scared especially now with uh, Wisconsin, the Wisconsin ruling with ballots and everyone talking about maybe you can't count them after election day. So it was a really great event. And then it came on at 5 uh, p.m. Uh, that day on Saturday. And um, I was I was like, oh, this was really good. So I put it I gave it to Lenny and I gave it to Rose. And it was a great it was a really great event. Thanks for doing that, Kevin. I put it into the chat, a link where you can read and, and hear about the event, the clip from NBC and also Block Club's coverage too. So good work on that. Um, Rana, you wanted to share? Okay, so some of you know me, some of you don't, but I live in the Breakers and Jonathan's mother lives in the Breakers by chance. And so what we did is we used to be the uh, polling place, but because of COVID, there's no polling here. So another woman and myself, she's from the Jane Addams Senior Caucus, Emily. We um, each took two hours every Wednesday and registered people to vote. And we, we put letters under people's doors who had moved in from January forward or changed apartments. Then when you couldn't register with the paper, with Motor Voter, we did it online. And then we were just there, we decided, four of us got together, we got two other women, and we decided that we'd be taking the ballots in and dropping them off for people at an early voting place. And Letty, um, well, we did this crazy live stream and I was really animated and wasn't crazy, it was fun because I was like really flying high because like in 15, 20 minutes, we just got this thing down packed. You know, you're doing this day, you're, do, you know, et cetera. So then um, I really haven't done anything up until today because of recovery and feeling tired, et cetera. So today I went downstairs, oh, back up. What I found out is somebody was spreading a rumor that the guy who's the director of this building, he could, it's like he sells snake oil, he's horrible. And he, um, that he was talking to City Hall about getting a drop box. I said, right, just special for the breakers. I said, right, you're full, you know, you're crazy. Well, what happened is he talked with them and maybe they do this with all the senior buildings. They sent, a, they came in, they had a list of everybody who was registered to vote in this building. And they had a list of who had applied for mail-in ballots. Then some of the staff went around, I found this out by accident yesterday, went around 
and talk to those people. Do you want an absentee ballot? Yes. Yesterday, they arrived in bulk. Somebody dropped them off. They passed them out to the people today. So I joined my friend Emily at about, she's got there at 11. I got there about a quarter to 12. I'd been at the doctor in the morning. And at one o'clock, we left the building. I'll back up for a second. But at one o'clock, we left the building and dropped off 10 mail-in ballots at the armory on Broadway in Thorndale. We were both, like, she's 84, and she's kind of a little reserved. I don't know how reserved, but, I mean, it was a riot. We're like, whew, we did it. And so we're doing it again on Friday, and we're doing it on Monday. But what happened is, <laughs> some of it does get a little goofy. This woman came down, and she's a caretaker for two of the people who live here. She gives us the envelope and I look at it and I go, mm, this is a problem. Because she signed the top line that says, I blah, 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 am dropping this off. Well, she wasn't the one dropping it off. So we didn't quite know what to do. So do we cross it out? No. So I called City Hall. I called Board of Elections and they said, don't worry about it. As long as it's signed, nobody's going to question that much. They don't really always ask for your ID. So when we went to drop it off, there was a line for the people who were going to be voting in person. And then somebody came over and they looked at everything. And the only thing that was a problem was somebody hadn't put down how long they'd lived here in the building. Oh. And if that's the only problem. So it was really, really cool to have done this. And we'll see what happens on Friday. How did you reach someone, Kevin, to get on the news? Kevin, how did we, you? We asked, um, Jen interviewed us all. And we said, how did you find this event? And she said she had been looking around for things. Uh, okay. And she, they found it some way. Okay. And they, she just showed up. Okay. So it was, really, it was really great. It was really nice. She was very nice, too. Yeah. I... I think the thing with getting into senior buildings and visiting, like you said, you can't visit. It's worse than here, I guess. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how that all works, Magda. And, but somebody should be working with your mother. And yeah, I assume, I assume the social worker will. Yeah. You know, if, if it is an issue, people, most of my, a lot of my friends and didn't write, when they signed the, the return envelope, they signed it, but they didn't put how long they work in the building. So I hope that if that's a problem, when they open the ballots, they're going to ask. What it is, is they just want to know that you've lived there longer than 30 yes. days. Yes. So that's what the whole thing is. Yeah. But as far as seniors, I mean, I don't know. I, I kind of, I am a senior. I'm 71. I'm still with it, thank God. Um, or thank goodness, whatever. And I think most of us know what we're doing and what we want. And Diane, that's wonderful, the work you've done. But um, yeah, we're out there and we're, you know, we're kicking and getting stuff done. Absolutely. Thank you, Rana, for sharing. I want to just flag that Nick is going to start live streaming on Indivisible Illinois Facebook page. Just in case you all um, have friends who couldn't make it, um, this recording will be there. And I wanted to see if Jonathan, did you want to give an update when we go live to let people know where we're at um, and to briefly talk about Indivisible Fire Street Voting Illinois? I can do a quick discussion on that, sure. Yeah, before we kick it over to Rose and our guests. Um, so we'll just wait for Nick to start the live. Oh. Hi, everybody. This is Lenny from Indivisible Illinois. Thanks for joining us on the very last voter engagement call. Um, on Wednesdays, we usually are here talking about voter registration and vote by mail. This is the last one before election day. And we're really excited to have Jonathan Rogoff here to give us an update on our grassroots website that was created, virusfreevotingillinois.org. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Lorena. Thank you, Rose, 
and Kelly and everybody else who helped to research and put that site up. Jonathan. Thank you, Lenny. Yeah, we've been doing uh, some interesting stuff with the virus free voting page. The big thing I've been doing is just trying to track the numbers and try and see at this point is when we're really starting to get to how are things looking for election day? How are things looking for election night? What are some of that? It's starting to sort of come into shape. And for the most part, the good news is, I mean, what is it? We've got, you know, in most parts of the state, we've got, uh, or I guess at least st uh, statewide, 31% of uh, registered voters have voted. We know we don't get to 100% of registered voters voting in, you know, pretty much any election cycle. So 31% seems, you know, like a pretty good number as far as that goes. We've also got, um, you know, in a lot of places, those, no you know, so what is it? I guess, uh, just real quick statewide numbers, that's, uh, 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 one point three four million people in the state have voted by have returned their vote by mail ballots. One point two five million people have voted early, and twenty four thousand have done grace period votes. So yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if by the end of this week the uh, early vote totals may actually exceed the vote by mail totals. Uh, given what we're what we're seeing and where we're at, so that's all looking good. Statewide, 57% uh, of the mail-in ballots have been returned, which uh, is also statewide looking looking pretty good. I am a little concerned in terms of uh, a few counties, primarily Bloomington Lake and suburban Cook, that are still a bit high in terms of the number of outstanding mail-in ballots. And that, you know, which could impact and delay results in those counties. Otherwise, all, all in all, we're looking pretty good. Um, there are, I'm updating daily those, those total, the totals that I just mentioned, as well as uh, some stuff about what, you know, putting, there's a little uh, triangular sign with the exclamation point warning sign for those counties that are still a little bit of a concern. There's like five or six of them total, but realistically, it's those three that are that are the ones where if you know people in those areas, try and get them, you know, remind them, get in your mail, if they've got mail-in ballots, they requested them, get those in, get that done. We don't wanna have a bunch of those outstanding and causing delays and in tabulating results. Um, otherwise, yeah, there's there, you know, there's also some stuff, the other emojis that are being updated daily kind of say, so there's a face with sunglasses, which is for the, for the uh, counties and jurisdictions that are in really good shape, there's a, uh, face with the with the with the hand that's kind of a little question you know kind of a little quizzical one um, for those that are not in great shape but not looking too bad all in all looking reasonable and then there's one with uh, concerned uh, wide eyes for those that are uh, that are struggling but as far as with this group it's like of the ones that are where, that where a low percentage have voted they're all counties with less than thirty thousand people in them. And pretty much, I'm assuming I haven't looked too deep into it, but I, I expect that most of those are all downstate and those are all probably a lot of Republican votes that are gonna come in on election day is probably what, what, what those are. So I'm not pushing too hard on and, or really worrying too much about those at this point either. But um, that's kind of quick updates. I guess I will end with this cute little, well, I thought it was a cute little thing. I was talking to someone and we were talking a little bit about, about the, you know, and, and, and talking about kind of getting the, turning the um, which counties and whatever um, and how they're voting and whatever into a little bit of a horse race, literally a horse race discussion. And so when it comes to the highest percentage of registered voters who have already voted, um, you know, as I were kind of saying, Rock Island, Peoria and Galesburg charged to a lead out of the gate at the beginning of October. Peoria and Galesburg faded back to the pack and Kane caught up to Rock Island once early voting expanded. Those two have been neck and neck for the last week or so, but Kane may be starting to break away. However, don't cut out DuPage making a late charge on the outside just yet. All right, so anyway, with that, I will uh, hand it back to Lenny. All right, thanks. That's great, Jonathan. Thank you so much for that. Um, Virusfreevotingillinois.org. Magda, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them into the chat. Um, I do want to point out for those of you who are in Cook County um, and you know anywhere across the state, find out where your drop boxes are. And if you've already voted, help others find out where their drop boxes are as well. In Cook County, you can drop off your ballot 
um, anywhere in the county. So, and, um, and please don't stand in line with the people who are early voting. Just go ahead and, and drop it off. Um, it should be, I was told that it should still be okay for you to drop off your ballots in um, the post, at the post office. But, um, you know, of course, find your drop boxes, help other people find them too. Um, you can also go to your county clerk and find out exactly where your polling place is. Um, know that you can, and actually I'm gonna pass it off to Rose because she has a couple of great speakers, uh, guests with us today. Rose Colosino is our 2020 Indivisible uh, Coordinator. She's our election um, protection, voter um, protection, also um, team leader, also coordinator for Wisconsin. We always hear from her on Thursdays. We are really grateful for you, Rose. Um, you are everywhere all at one time. And um, I know that you are looking forward to the end of this in six days. So I'll pass it to you, Rose. Thank you so much, Lenny, and hi, everybody. Special hello to our guest speakers this evening, Jessica and Jake. Jake, I have heard you speak. We haven't met formally, but um, we're really thrilled to have both of you here. And I also want to send out a special hello to Jonathan Simon. So uh, really, really excited to have you here, Jonathan, and would love to uh, hopefully hear from you as well. So for those of you that don't know me, not too many people, but uh, I am the election security voting rights lead for Indivisible Illinois, as Lenny stated. And uh, I've also been um, very interested in our swing states. So have been working in Wisconsin since 2018 and just can't wait to turn Wisconsin back to blue very, very soon. So um, we are going to jump in. I'm going to uh, try to be as brief as possible. I want to get our uh, guest speakers started, but a couple of announcements, especially because hard to believe, isn't it? But this is our last vote by mail task force meeting. We've been doing this, if my count is right, about eight months. And I just want to let you all know how much I appreciate you showing up every week. We have these marathons on uh, Wednesday, these marathon uh, conference calls. So thank you, thank you those great, amazing numbers that Jonathan brought up. And Jonathan, Sarah, everybody, thank you for putting together such an amazing website. That is really because of you. I'm gonna take uh, full credit for that. The uh, vote by mail numbers in Illinois, I think uh, we did have something to do with that. Also wanna thank our friends at uh, IL Vote, Lenny, your leadership and uh, the collaboration with Voter Reg. We got this thing, we have to, we've been working so hard. And just real briefly, since this is a last call, I wanna just share with you some of the things that we have accomplished with the Vote by Mail Task Force. We've had a whole bunch of Twitter storms and essentially what that is is a social media day because the election officials told us that they would appreciate that. So um, we've had uh, about a dozen today from 12 until two was our last one. We've made, for those of you that know what I'm talking about, 18 million impressions, so not too shabby. I think that uh, Lorena might carry the torch for next week, so uh, don't be surprised if you see another one there. Also, again, the website, I, I just can't tell you, Jonathan, Sarah, how many accolades we get on that website. Um, really, it is most definitely making a difference. I don't know if Lori is here, but um, Lori has been very busy passing out placard, placards which basically give information about voter reg and vote by mail and early voting. She did uh, only 7,000. So uh, that's just uh, phenomenal. And um, I think probably all in all, these uh, placards started out with Magda. We should call them Magda cards, right Magda? But um, probably close to 8,000 on that. And um, last but not least, we really had a lot of fun calling into underserved communities. and. Um, we ended that last week. We had about 10 phone banks and made about uh, 5,000 calls into underserved communities. So um, very exciting. And again, thank you all for participating in uh, one or all of that. Besides that, I wanna just uh, be brief as far as my voting reminders that I give out. I did have a list of about 10, but uh, trying to be quick here. So I'll give you three only. So uh, vote and vote early, of course. I think uh, with vote by mail, we just wanna make sure we get those in. And at this point, we would uh, highly recommend voting safely early. Two, I wanna remind everybody, I think everybody on this call knows that we might not get the results on um, the third. So uh, we need to be patient and we need to tell everybody else that that is okay. We might get the results uh, 
a little later than November the 3rd. I'll just share with you, Jonathan just uh, briefed us on the numbers. I want to say this has probably grown because they're growing so quickly. I have recorded 71 million Americans have voted already. Wow, that's uh, just spectacular. And in Illinois, and I think this is all because of us, uh, 2.6 million Illinois residents. And um, Jonathan has much more information on our website. Besides that, Illinois is an important state for fair tax, of course. But uh, let's uh, send some love to our friends in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. Lots of ways to help. We talked about some of those on the prior call, but uh, phone banks, also election protection. We didn't talk that much about. I'll try to drop some links in the chat. And um, of course, in your free time, work the Senate. I just want to say in ending that um, I started out in this space with election security really starting in 2016, because I was um, horrified that our uh, clearing house, our voter registration clearing house was hacked. And I did have an election security strategic team, mouthful. And uh, that really morphed into this vote by mail task force because of COVID, COVID-19. And um, really, I can go on and on about that. I won't, I promise. But uh, why vote by mail? Because paper can't be hacked. So um, we have been touting and we will continue to tout Right, Jessica, Jake, and Jonathan, handmark paper ballots, and of course, more robust post election audits. I um, won't get on my high horse too long, but I want to tell you that uh, we are using ballot marking devices in um, Cook County and Chicago. I just want to let everybody know please check your responses. Make sure your uh, review on the screen is what you selected originally, and you will receive a paper receipt. People usually only spend, if anything, seconds. Looking at that paper receipt, if you vote for Biden, and God, I hope you do, uh, make sure that Biden's name is on there, Kim Fox, Fair Tax, and um, all the rest. So now, at last, on to our guests. I will introduce to you briefly, really, because I think their intros would take the whole uh, half hour that we have, or 20 minutes that we have left, but um, Jessica Himino and also Jake Brown, Braun, sorry. Jessica is a healthcare and disability rights and election security activist. Jake is executive director for the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy, Cyber Policy. They will discuss election security in 2020 and beyond, including Jake's excellent book, I highly recommend, Democracy in Danger. So with that, Jessica, the floor is all yours and thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Rose. So Jake, I think your book, Democracy in Danger is the easiest to understand book on the subject. If you can describe for people who are new to this, mm -hmm. what are the five components of election infrastructure? Um, well, thanks. And first of all, thank you all for having me um, uh, so close to the election and getting all, hearing all those updates. You guys really have a lot going on. So I uh, also applaud all your hard work. I know um, so many of you have been, been uh, deeply involved um, for a long time. Uh, but anyway, thanks for the book plug. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, um, so, yeah, I think when most people think about elections, they think about, you know, the, there's a machine or, or you know, that they vote on or, or the ballot or whatever, but there's really a, a handful of pieces um, to this. So one, of course, is the machine that you go vote on or that you put your ballot into. Um, I, uh, we might get into this later, but I could not agree with Rose's point more about the hand marked paper ballots and these ballot marking devices that have been in my existence. But nonetheless, um, there's the machine. But then on top of that, there's a database that that um, has all the, the list of the voters, the registered voters in the state. And that's a key um, uh, kind of component of the overall thing and something that is that is attached to, but kind of its own entity and its own kind of attack vector, as they say. Um, uh, there's also the the website that that um, from the clerk's office of the Secretary of State that publishes the election results or the unofficial results, um, uh, but can if if tampered with as as Russia did in the Ukraine in um, in 2014, or by the way we saw a fake um, Cook County Board of Election Facebook page that was put up in the 2020 primaries. They luckily got taken down, but it was made to look exactly like. Um, the real page and uh, um, presumably had nefarious intent, we don't know. But anyway, so there's the public facing uh, web page that displays the results, where to vote and so on. Um, 
Then there's also the network that attaches all these things together. Um, so the database um, has to be able to talk to um, the different machines. A lot of the election officials will say, well, that's separate from the network, but it does have to touch something that touches the network eventually. Um, uh, that same network um, that connects all the computers in the clerk's office um, has to be able to get software and um, the, the candidates on the ballot and so on onto these machines, um, and then needs to be able to get the results um, onto the, the website. Um, and then on top of that, you have the ballots themselves um, and so on. So I think a lot of people um, may not kind of consider all these different pieces in the equation and the fact that each one of them, separate from the paper ballot itself, um, can be hacked. And if, if it is um, breached or whatever, can cause its own type of, of kind of chaos and disruption. Thank you for describing that. A, a lot of people, including lawmakers, think the more technology we have, the better, the more modernized. But how easy is it in reality to hack a voting machine? You know, it's funny. It's it's uh, lawmakers might think that, but the technologists uh, don't. Um, and if you if you look at uh, um, the National Academy of Sciences, um, they put out this great report that actually was started before 2016. Um, and, and has been echoed by many um, of the most kind of brilliant technologists uh, in this country and others that say, look, you know, we don't care what kind of machine um, you have or how secure people say it is or whether there's blockchain involved or God only knows what. Um, a machine is a machine and it can be hacked. Um, and as technologists, we know that we can't always trust the machines. And so that, that's why we want to have a, a voter marked paper ballot. Um, now, I, I know that, uh, you know, often in, in, in Cook in, in Chicago, um, you'll often see that there's a ballot marking device um, for those in the disability community to use. And, and that's great. And, and having one of those per precinct is kind of considered a best practice. Um, but then other voters can use uh, the, the paper ballots. Um, and, and, uh, the reason uh, why we want these paper ballots to be used is A, these ballot marking devices, um, which supposedly um, stop people from making mistakes. Um, well, it turns out 94% of people who make mistakes don't catch the mistake, which is the whole purpose of these ballot marking devices. Um, but since it's a machine, it can be hacked um, as well, um, or just break, which is the problem with a bunch of these things, and then cause really long lines, which is um, uh, you know what what happens every cycle, um, and if we have a, if we have a, a paper ballot, we can then do what they call risk limiting audits, which is where I'm oversimplifying this, but you count a small but statistically significant number of the ballots to figure out whether the machines were hacked. Um, and if we, get, we have to wind up counting all of them, you do, but we can't do that if it's a direct recording device. Um, and again, if it's a if it's a ballot marking device you introduce all these other vulnerabilities and so on and so forth. So you want a paper ballot and risk limiting audits. So um, the million dollar question, what happened in the 2016 elections? Ugh. I mean, a, you know, a perfect storm of failures is what happened, you know, um, you know, with the, the Russians, it seemed um, hacked into these voter registration databases and quote unquote scanned them. Um, what most people don't know is that despite election officials saying that these voter registration databases are air gapped um, and completely separate from the network, turns out if you read page 50 of the Mueller report, and I, I have the page number memorized because I've had to say this so many times in the press, um, uh, the way the Russians got to the voter registration databases was by hacking the website of the secretaries of state and others and then we're able to there worm their way um, into the database. So so much, so much for an air gap between the the database and the network. Um, and by the way, the exploit the Russians used was so simple to use that at DEF CON um, we had, which is the largest hacker conference in the world, we had children um, that were 11 years old um, uh, hack uh, the the um, fake websites we made up with the exact same exploit the Russians used. So it's not like they were using the most high-tech um, zero-day um, cyber attacks you can imagine. So as all that's going down, um, 
uh, you had a lot of election officials and others um, start to kind of say, oh, well, you know, this isn't a problem because our systems are so disaggregated. You know, the bad guys could never hack um, everything uh, and, and change votes. And, uh, and so they would come back and say, well, we have no evidence any votes were tampered with or changed, which is true. They don't have any evidence any votes were tampered with or changed, but they also have no capability to go and see if any votes were tampered with or changed. So um, it's like saying, uh, you know, I don't know, you're, you're sitting in a, um, you know, in a closet with the lights off and, uh, you know, somebody comes in and steals something out of the room and you open the door and turn the lights on, you say, well, you know, I, uh, um, you know, I, I didn't see anything. And it's like, well, you were sitting in the closet with the lights off, like you didn't have any ability to see anything. Um, and so uh, that kind of lulled everybody into some complacency until um, at, at DEF CON, we, we uh, showed that we could hack voting machines in two minutes and, and, uh, and so on. And, and a lot of people started to, to to realize how vulnerable we really were. And it wasn't just us. There were a lot of folks deep, you know, very focused on, on highlighting the, um, how vulnerable we were. Um, so that's kind of a, a really 65,000 foot overview of, of what happened. There's a lot more to it than that, but. Um, so what was the response to these concerns about cybersecurity leading up to the 2016 election? Leading up to 2016? Yes, leading up to it. Because, you know, there were people warning about this. Oh, 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 right. Um, I, yeah, okay. I thought you meant years and years before. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> uh, it was in many ways something that a lot of people just thought was unfathomable. I mean, I just read an article the other day about how um, folks at NSA, um, and again, these are our spies that we spend lots of money to make sure that they have the tools they need to know what's going on around the world and, and protect us and certainly our democracy. And they said they found out about this on CNN. They had no idea um, that Russians were hacking into our voting equipment and so on. Um, it just wasn't even on their radar. Um, and you know, I remember having conversations both with senior officials on the Democratic um, side of, uh, of the campaign, as well as officials um, at Homeland Security and elsewhere. And it seemed like everybody kind of thought somebody, it was someone else's job and somebody else was doing it. Um, a lot of the folks on uh, the kind of senior democratic folks assumed that Homeland Security and, and NSA and, and these other FBI and so on kind of had it under control and they knew what was going on and so on. Um, and then uh, when you talk to officials on the government side of the ledger, they, they uh, said that, you know, for a lot of these things, they, they thought it was the campaign's job to, to deal with local election officials, um, to fight over things like paper trails and paper ballots and so on, but that wasn't there. You know, they were only supposed to let folks know if we had, you know, um, forensic evidence that, you know, machines had been hacked or something, which of course nobody had because we had no capability of, of finding that. Um, so the, the national security officials are pointing at the campaigns saying, well, it's your guys' job to go harass the clerks and make them have a paper trail. And the campaign saying, well, we assume that Homeland Security and, and Cybercom are doing this because isn't that their job? And it turned out. Yeah, no, no, one, no one, everybody thought somebody else was taking care of it, that assumption. Uh, it's almost like on that grand scale, like the bystander effect on the very large scale. Right. So yeah, and that's, you know, deadly assumption. What, what are your concerns for the 2020 elections? Uh, I, I have two very specific concerns. Um, and especially now that we've kind of seen what the Russians uh, and others, well, specifically the Russians who seem to be the biggest threat still, despite the news that we just saw about Iran, um, is that, uh, if they continue to administer malware or ransomware attacks on voter registration databases, which if you look New York, at the New York Times and other outlets um, have reported that um, Russian criminal organizations, which often is not all that different from the Russian mob, I mean, from the Russian intelligence services have administered or, or you know, um, set in motion or, or attacked 
um, voter registration databases in counties around the country, um, several in Texas they cited, uh, and lock down the data, the voter registration data. Well, if that were to happen on a, on a broader scale, especially in battleground states, we wouldn't know who was sent a ballot um, or who was sent an absentee request uh, form, who sent back the request form, who was sent a ballot, who's, who sent back their ballot, whether that ballot was counted, whether that tally was put in the overall tally. Um, because again, the, that network that controls all this stuff kind of houses that data in the voter registration database. Um, and if that's locked down, it would be total chaos um, yeah. on election day um, in the days leading up to it. And then separately, you know, I'm, I'm concerned that on election night, you're gonna have, uh, or you could potentially see, um, and again, it seems like we already had a, at a, an attempt at this with Cook County in the primary um, where they created a fake but very official looking Facebook page for Cook County, um, attacks on the websites that uh, publish the unofficial election results. Um, and, you know, if we had a situation where, you know, Pennsylvania and, and Michigan and Wisconsin um, all have the wrong results up there or, or they get what they call a DDoS attack and the websites are down and so we don't know what the results are at all, um, that, that would also cause total chaos. And of course, we don't want this to feed into Trump's hands where um, he says, oh, well, look at what a mess this is. We're going to sue and try and invalidate the election or something crazy like that. And it goes to the Supreme Court, um, which would obviously be not, not good. <laughs> so, what can we do to protect this election? Um, so in the last uh, uh, um, and by the way, I noticed it sounds like some folks are in Wisconsin as well as this. I know you guys are an Illinois group, but are people spread out around other states as well? Or there, there I, mean, are. I know to Indivisible, I know Indivisible is national, but I think this is, is this the Illinois chapter. Or? There's people from other states who have joined us, Wisconsin, California, New York. Okay, that just because my answer, because people vote in different ways in different places. So my answer depends on where people are. Um, so I would say, a couple different things. A, um, if if you are, you know, based on how they vote in your state, able to um, request and vote on a paper ballot that that you mark with your own hand, um, do that. That's thing one, and, and please tell your friends to do it too. Because if there are cyber attacks, if there's other, you know, problems or whatever on election day, at least we can go back and we can recount all the ballots. So that's thing one. Um, thing two is, you know, separate from cyber attacks and so on and so forth, uh, the thing that actually disenfranchises the most voters every cycle or every presidential year, at least, um, to the tune of hundreds of thousands and maybe even millions is long lines. And it, it particularly affects our voters, um, people who live in urban areas um, because they're more densely consolidated at the precinct level. And so we have fewer machines per um, voter and people wind up in these six and eight hour long lines. We've seen this in Georgia and Milwaukee, all over the place. Um, but, you know, we developed this thing in 2008 on the Obama campaign that is uh, now housed by MIT. And I can send you this link after this, where election officials can go in and, and put in all the resources they have, like this many voting machines or booths or whatever, this many um, people who, who uh, check in voters and all this stuff. And the thing will tell them how to um, uh, deploy their resources so that they can minimize long lines. And this, is, this isn't just some crazy thing academics do. do. It's um, many new election officials are trained with this tool um, to use it so that they deploy their assets um, in the most efficient way possible. Um, it's, again, it's housed by MIT, I'll send it to, um, to you after this, Jessica, okay. and you can send it to the group. And folks, it's completely reasonable for you to tweet at, email, call your local election official and say, what are you gonna do to prevent long lines this cycle? And by the way, if you don't know, use this tool. Um, it's, it's free, it's online, um, and it's housed by you know, an incredibly reputable institution, which is MIT. Um, and I think those two things, get a paper ballot and, and really advocate that your election official um, 
uh, has a plan to minimize long lines on election day. So going forward, you know, because we're concerned about this election, but also, you know, we have midterms in 2022. How can concerned citizens get involved in pushing for more transparent, more secure elections? Um, you know, I think so, depending on what happens in the House and Senate, um, if you look at HB1 uh, that came out last year, two years ago, I think last year, maybe two years ago, um, it was a, a, a bill that came out of House Homeland um, that is a that is honestly, I mean, look, all bills have flaws, but it is, especially as it relates to election security, a pretty good bill um, uh, that provides for federal research and development dollars to build new um, a next generation of election equipment, which we desperately need and the vendors will never spend the money to do. Um, it provides for bug bounty programs to bring in the hacker and research community um, to legally go find vulnerabilities so that folks can fix them. Um, it provides the for same day registration, which is the um, number one best way to prevent, um, or sorry, defend against attacks on our voter registration databases um, is to let people register there on site. So no matter what they do to the database, voters can vote there. Um, it, does, it does a lot of really good things. So if we win advocating that um, they pass that bill or some uh, version of it, I think would be thing one. And then thing two, and I know a lot of folks have been saying this this cycle, but um, you know, there, there's an enormous amount of effort and time that goes into poll watching and all this stuff. And that's great. And if you're signed up to be a poll watcher, good, please do it. But I would strongly advocate that in the next election, add, sign up to be a poll worker. You can have far more impact on how the election is administered and ensuring that it's administered in the most fair and transparent and appropriate way possible. Um, if you are on the other side of the table, um, helping administer the election. Um, and so if you can sign up to be a poll worker, um, that'd be great. And by the way, even if we have a vaccine, you know, now when they start deploying it, um, COVID will still likely be a, a huge factor. And so we're going to need people helping process and count absentees as well. Um, I know, you know, in, in a county in Virginia that we were doing, uh, um, we were coordinating with, they had six people to process and count all their absentees. And by their own math, they needed 63 people to actually get through all the ballot requests and ballots, meaning that they, I mean, there were people who's, who were gonna be disenfranchised um, because of the um, minuscule uh, um, size of their workforce. And it wasn't like they didn't have budget to pay people, they just didn't have people who signed up to help. So a lot of thinking in advance. Uh, Rose, I know you had something Morning. Yes, I know that we're not going to unfortunately be able to get to all of the questions I have saved them. And um, if our guests are so inclined, uh, perhaps they could uh, get back to us at a later time. But um, I do sure. want to at this time we usually transition it's eight o'clock to the indivisible state leader call. However, if everybody could just uh, hang on uh, Jonathan Simon is here, uh, another leader in election security Jonathan would you mind just uh, taking a couple of minutes to tell us also about uh, your work. Sure, thanks Rose and, and uh, it's been fascinating listening. Um, I, I'm sorry I'm in the dark. Uh, I'm not in my house, so <laughs> kind of limited uh, facilities here. But um, well, you know, as some of you probably know, I mean, I've been working with election integrity and election forensics since 2002. And uh, it's been, you know, very bruising and uphill. And as Jake has found out, you know, even working from the inside and even with quite a bit of credential and credibility, you run into a lot of brick walls. Um, mm -hmm. And there's, you know, this is a system that's really been designed to be concealed and it fights like hell to remain concealed, both sort of in the, des the design part of it and also in the event that there is an attempt at investigation or drilling down, what the data and the kind of evidence we can have access to is very, very, very limited and virtually no direct evidence, no, you know, none of the uh, code or the memory cards or anything like that. That's all proprietary and off limits. So we do what we can with numbers. And I think going into this election, there's there's been a tremendous amount of work uh, and 
you know, commendable. It's good to see our, our country step up in this way um, about casting a ballot and how you have the best chance of success of having your ballot successfully cast and counted. Um, and then what we're gonna be doing is sort of transitioning into looking at the count phase and trying to um, pick up any evidence of, of red flags of, of, you know, there'll be glitches. There's always problems in the stochastic system where you're counting millions of ballots. Uh, they're going to be uh, they're going to be glitches, and it's not going to be perfect. Uh, but we're going to be looking for directional signs, signs that um, there's patterns involved where there's a red shift, for instance, uh, in a series of elections that are competitive, but let's say not in elections that are non-competitive. That's the kind of pattern that says, okay, these elections have been targeted. This isn't just computer glitches or random issues or random uh, uh, sampling. Uh, statistical things with an exit poll, let's say, this is an actual attack, which could be coming from the outside. It's you know, coming into our counting process, into the voter registration process we know from Russia, uh, but it could also very well be coming from the inside by those who have gained access through the vendors or through their various satellites um, to the programming process itself. We're somewhere in that pipeline. So we're gonna be looking for signs of that, which could be disparities uh, from the pre-election polls. Uh, if we're fortunate enough to have exit polls, which we're still not 100% sure we're gonna have or what form they're gonna be in, but we will use those as well. We will use pattern analysis, cumulative vote share analysis, any tools we can. So we're gonna be busy on election night. Um, and because this election is different and the vote totals may be a kind of rolling, uh, slow rolling process, we're gonna be busy for the days following the election. And then we're gonna just sort of see what happens. If we see red flags, there will be, there are organizations that are, um, in position, uh, maybe not with, you know, full, full, ar full arsenals, but can go out and do deeper drill downs at the precinct level, at the voter level. Uh, democracy counts is one of those. Uh, protect the results, um, obviously, you know, through indivisible. Um, there are people photographing poll tapes, and all that data will then come in potentially uh, useful if there are indicators of problems. Unfortunately, you can steal an election and there won't necessarily be any indicators of problems uh, if you do it well enough. Um, and, and if nobody's willing to pay attention to the, the data that we have, and that's been the case in 2016, in 2004, in 2010, uh, just really throughout the computerized voting age. Um, so we hope we don't see any signs. If we see them, we're gonna be trying to organize them, spreadsheet them, figure it out, get some sort of idea where deeper investigation has to take place. <laughs> And I will say in a very general sense, there's a lot of activity, as you probably know, out there. Um, the question is, you know, on our side, on protecting the election, the question is, well, you know, will it be coordinated enough? And will, when push comes to shove, will the media, will the political class, and will the American people respond to concerns or alarms red flags about the election. And of course, we're in a doubly difficult position there because in certain ways, post-electoral challenges and chaos, post-electoral uh, concerns about illegitimacy play directly into Donald Trump's hands and he's made no bones about that's the scenario he's looking for. So we have to be very, very careful about what we uh, public, you know, in terms of public facing, what we allege, uh, what we, you know, scream fraud from the rooftops has to be really, really solidly based, uh, and then hope that the investigative process takes over from there. I have a question. So let's say people are experiencing red flags when they're voting election night. How could they contact you about that so that they could, you know, work so we could work together? Yeah, well, I mean, it would probably be a mistake to contact me because I'm okay. going to be busy downloading and crunching numbers. Um, there is a voter hotline, the 866-R-VOTE, but there's also csay2020.com, um, which is in certain ways better 
because what they're doing is they're actually um, identifying the sources of the complaints and mapping them. Um, so it creates, you know, for those who are trying to figure out, well, where do we have problems, Houston, uh, it will tell you, yeah, well, you have problems in South Florida, or you have problems in Cook County, or whatever. Um, so csa2020.com, I, I believe it's a dot com, um, is uh, really something to, to write down and spread the word on. Um, 866-R-VOTE is, is the traditional hotline. There are a couple of others out there and you can do a little research. Uh, I don't have them off the tip of my, yeah. Yeah. you know, protect our votes, okay. protect our votes, uh, dot org um, is another one. Um, and I always get, if you, you know, this, everything's gone so crazy with information and misinformation. So you'll have something like the electoral integrity project which is a perfectly legitimate, uh, if rather tame, project run by Harvard and the University of Sydney. And then you get something called the Election Integrity Project, um, which is a far right wing disenfranchisement mill out of California. And so, you know, it's gotten to that point where, you know, both sides are obviously this is super high stakes um, it's for all the marbles. I, I, I've been saying blue tsunami red thumbs for all the marbles and the red thumbs are the thumbs that are you know have already we've seen on the scale we hope you know there will be thumbs that we probably can't see on the scale um and they haven't been shy about coming out and essentially saying look the only way we can win this election is in one way or another by uh shifting votes by disenfranchisement voter suppression uh vote flipping whatever the hell it court cases whatever whatever yeah. it takes um, so you know that's where we are unfortunately jonathan i want to thank you so much i think that uh we need about uh an hour or a couple of hours to uh cover all the ground that is uh necessary to cover i do appreciate your time jake thank you thank you so much jessica thank you and uh jonathan and um, I personally think information is power and it is going to help me sleep a little better at night when I know that the three of you are out there protecting the vote. So um, thank you for sharing with us. I'm feeling good about this, everybody. I usually have good uh, intuition. So I'm feeling strong. I'm gonna keep going with that. And um, I just appreciate everybody's work and uh, a really special heartfelt thank you to Jake and Jessica and uh, Jonathan, thank you so, so very much. And I actually do have information, um, if I do have a moment to speak again on the state leader call about uh, CESA.2020.com. So I do have um, some information on that. Uh, the great group of uh, Reclaim Our Vote um, covers that. And um, I think that's uh, an excellent uh, suggestion, Jonathan. So uh, with that, thank you everyone. And Lenny, I turn it over to you. Thanks, Rose. I will ask um, the guests to please stick around just for a moment. And if you have a button or if you have your book that you want to show off, this is our last Wednesday call before the elections. And we would love to see your buttons or stickers or your I voted sticker. And we're going to take a, a screenshot here. Jake, we would love, and Simon, we would love you to stick around and Jessica. Thank you so much for joining us. Is it upside? If anybody has um, buttons or stickers that you want to show off, oh. would love to see them in the screen. And we're going to take I'll, this. I have Jonathan's book. I'll, I'll get my book. Hold on. I okay. got Jonathan's book somewhere. Oh, I love that. Yeah, well, that Sarah. might be better than my my copy of it since I'm in the dark here. And although That's, we did figure out the that the light, the light. I out. got the book right here. <laughs> okay, this is fantastic. I see she's actually read it. That's that's okay. terrific. Look at all the markings, yeah. Jessica. I think I'll do this. Oh, yeah, so many notes. Oh my gosh, Jessica, that's awesome. Yeah. Th thank you, everybody. I think we're okay, waiting we're, for Jake. We're waiting for Jake. Book. Jake's okay. book. We need Jake's book. Which is terrific. Jake's book is it's hard Etta, to get through because it's Etta, hard Etta, stuff. But Magda and Etta, are you gonna join us? I can't tell Magda if you're you're gonna join us. So we're gonna we're gonna take this shot in three seconds. Ready? Three, two, one. Thank you so much. We are 
very honored that you were here with us today. Thank you. And please, if you, if you, you wouldn't mind just putting into the chat how people can contact you or a website that you want us to okay. be directed to, because we would love to stay in touch. Sure, thanks. Thank you, Rose, for the Vote by Mail Task Force and all the work that you all have been doing for the last eight months. It's absolutely the way that that we needed to go. We we needed to start from the from Rose's work and starting in 2016 with the voter security, election security, and here we are. Um, and we're ready to go. We've only got six more days left until this election day. Um, Here's the thing, we are here because of you, because of all the work that you've done, because you've made it here until the till the very end. We did not know where this was gonna go um, after Trump got elected. I know I didn't, um, but we knew that we had to put one step in front of ourselves, one step at a time, and bringing other people along with us was the way that we were gonna do it. We are. Um, we were very inspired by many of you here who have been doing this work for a very long time, including those of us from um, OFA. I see you there, Sarah and Jean Sloan and Peoria. You've been doing this work for a very long time. And Sarah Bingaman, you have been doing this work before Indivisible ever got off the ground. So um, thank you for that. Um, and we have been led and um, advised and counseled by Others, our allies, including our, especially our healthcare advocates, including Jessica, who's on the call with us today. Um, and I know Miranda was here earlier. So thank you all for that. We've been inspired by our creativity, including um, everyone um, such as Sandra Alexander, um, Wise. I remember um, we had those cutouts. <laughs> I just saw that picture the other day and I, I, I laughed so hard that we're like, six Peter Roskam cutouts in Federal Plaza and a big, big uh, check. Um, and we've been fighting for our health care, you know, ever since then. Um, and we will continue to do so. We'll continue to fight for our health care even now. So thank you all for being here. It's absolutely such a, I'm so proud to be here with you. Um, but there is, there's six more days until election day. And you know that there are, are a lot more there are many more things to do. Um, people are looking to you for advice. Um, Flo, I believe it was, um, oh, who was it? Merle was telling us that yes, people are asking, <laughs> what, do, what do I do? Where do I vote? Um, you know, there are many things that we have been talking about week after week, as Rosa said, for the last eight months, we knew this was gonna come to this day and here it is. Um, but here's the thing, we need to just keep on putting out the good work that we have been doing because people need to understand that this isn't the end, right? This is the beginning. This is the beginning of the next chapter. We need to turn the page um, after November 3rd. It's not gonna be over just like that. There are a lot of ballots to count. I'm excited to look at Texas though because I know at the end of the day, Texas is gonna be good to go. And I'm, I'm excited to, um, to see how many um, votes we get over there. Um, I'm very, very excited to have Rose back up to the mic, um, who can give us another synopsis of um, where we are in Illinois. Rose, would you like to do that now or? Sure, I'm sure people wanna hear more from me. They just heard from me before, so I'll just continue on. I do have a script number two right here. And um, again, famous last words, I will try to be brief. But um, yes, my usual talk divided up into uh, Wisconsin. Hi, Emily, I don't know if you remember, we spoke on the phone way back when. So uh, grateful to have you on board and thank you for all your good work. I uh, have some options to share with the team here and then I really look forward to hearing from uh, Emily about how to take it home and bring, uh, bring the job home and get it done. So um, let me talk about Wisconsin first, and then I'm going to talk about uh, virus-free voting. Notice the switch. We're kind of moving on from uh, vote by mail to uh, virus-free voting exclusively. So I went ahead, I already posted this in the chat. I just have a number of options because um, it's not uncommon. I've had quite a few people come to me and uh, ask what else can I do? 
I've been writing postcards, I've been writing letters, I'm done with that and I wanna do something different. So here are some uh, options. You have a plethora of uh, options to choose from. And I know number one on everybody's list, Nick, is phone banking. I can just, uh, I can just feel it. But um, there are calls that you can make directly to Wisconsin. I've got a link for that, for bridge building and GOTV. That's uh, in the master link that I sent you. Also, I've expressed to you in the past, for those of you that were on prior calls, we've been working with a great group of uh, Block, B-L-O-C, in Wisconsin, and um, Angela Lang and her team does a phenomenal work. They are looking for poll observers and poll watchers. If anybody is so inclined, because I believe that some of the slots are getting filled up. I know that we are no longer for Working Wednesdays doing the Wisconsin Democrats uh, GoPro calls because uh, you guys have already signed up and done such a great job. So if there is any more bandwidth, uh, Angela Lang needs you. And uh, if Angela Lang calls, I try to uh, answer. So there will be training. Again, it's in the link. What's different about this poll, observing, poll watching, whatever you want to call it, is that um, they are looking for folks to de-escalate. We're hoping for the best, but preparing for the worst, right? So um, this training is uh, organized by Center for Popular Democracy. That is uh, who Angela is working with. And um, they are specifically looking for folks uh, for election day, if that works out for your schedules. And as mentioned in the past, souls to the polls, I think really mostly they need your money. I know um, Chris Martin, Dr. Chris has been really active trying to find drivers. The word is that uh, we're uh, going to turn to um, Lyft and Uber because of COVID. So I think really more so Reverend Greg Lewis, and uh, again, the link is within the link. He needs your donations to make, that, uh, to make those rides happen and to make sure every available voter has the chance to vote. So let me uh, switch gears here a little bit to uh, virus-free voting. I have a lengthier overview, but I'm going to really repeat what I said on um, the last segment where um, I, I had the opportunity to speak. We, number one, at this point, I would highly recommend early voting and early voting safely. Bring your mask, bring your own pen, um, social distance, make sure you practice all those things and um, do early vote at this point. Also, it's very important to um, spread the word. I think all of you guys know it, but we might not get results on November the 3rd. I think Brett Kavanaugh and the others are really working hard <laughs> against that, but um, spread the word. It is perfectly legitimate for the results not to come in on November the 3rd. And um, Kevin, just real quick on uh, Illinois, as long as you brought this up earlier, as long as it is postmark on um, November the 3rd, your uh, ballots can trickle in up to, I believe, um, at least the 16th. So um, that's Illinois. Wisconsin, whole nother uh, ball of wax, right, Emily? And it could change uh, on the dime as it did in April. And uh, besides that, I think Etta is here somewhere, that great uh, disinformation, misinformation presentation that she made that uh, if you don't have it and you need it, this is something I have been following since 2016, but I certainly learned a lot. And um, just don't be discouraged by that disinformation, misinformation, and know the right steps that you can take. So um, I'll just end by saying I have links for about six, seven months. I work with uh, Tyler St. Clair. We gave voter education presentations. I do know that Common Cause and the Lawyers Committee has a uh, voter protection team, and I believe they're still recruiting. So you can do that. Also, some of you might be familiar with Working Families Party. I'm talking now, sorry, about Illinois. So Working Families has something called Election Defenders training series, and uh, there is still availability for that. Again, all of these links are within that uh, master link. And then I was so excited to hear, I don't know if he's still here, Jonathan, to hear him talk about CSAY 2020. That is something that the Vote by Mail Diversity and Inclusion Task Force spoke about. Um, take a look. I have a more expansive description of what that is, but... Um, I'm really excited about it even more so now that I heard uh, Jonathan tout it. But um, I do think that it's something that we can use to fight biter, voter suppression. And with that, I think that's uh, everything. And uh, it's just been a pleasure to be on these calls with you for, I guess it's since uh, maybe 2017 or so. And I'm um, looking forward to the victory party. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Rose. 
We will be back though, Rose, tomorrow, uh, Thursday for the last Fibers for Voting um, live stream with HIPAA and the Wisconsin Dems. Um, but thank you for that. Uh, right now we're gonna have Emily on from Wisconsin. And I just wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you to Emily and all that you're doing over there. Um, I signed up to be a poll observer in Wisconsin. I'm learning so much. Um, I'm very grateful actually for Illinois and all of the great voter laws that we have in Illinois. Um, so we we should really turn out to, to show that it is so easy to vote, right? All we need to do is just do it. Especially in Cook County, I would implore you just to tell your friends if you're in Cook County, please, please, please um, turn in your ballots. Um, Emily, um, I, I've been traveling up there. I've been learning a lot. Um, I know that you're on to talk about voter protection. I just wanted to say thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you with Nick. The collaboration between you, both of you, has been really what's keeping us going. It is, you know, we are grassroots, we are volunteers, we are doing this on our free time and um, your leadership, it really makes a difference. It, um, it makes it fun. We've been having fun banks because of you um, and we look forward to six more days of fun banks. So at this time, I'm gonna give it to Emily to take it away. Thank you. you I, I just like listening to Rose and listening to you, like it just, I am so grateful. So on behalf of Cheeseheads across the state here in Wisconsin, like thank you so much for the work that you've done and then your, your doggedness and determination and recognizing that when, you know, like as, as the Wisconsin Dems like say, when we, when one of us does better, we all do better, right? Um, and so I just really, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for the time um, and efforts that you put into helping. Um, it, I mean, the polls are the polls are looking good, y'all. So that's exciting. Um, the work is not done. We still got time left, but it's looking it's looking really promising. Um, so I just want to start out with that, like that work, that work that you dedicated yourselves to, is so vital and such a a crucial piece to hope what we're hoping to see happen um, across the state on November 3rd. So first of all, thank you for that. Like I'm just, it's been so fun getting to know you all, at least digitally <laughs> um, for the last few months. I'm looking forward to the, like the Halloween calling phone bank on Saturday. I've got my costume prepared. Um, I, there may be cameos for my children. So it's really exciting times. Um, and so I just wanted to like clue you into what is happening, I guess. Um, I know that Rose, you spoke to a lot of different options for helping in Wisconsin. I'm gonna put in right now in the chat, another link to the last frontline election defenders um, training that's happening tomorrow. So Nora is our contact um, that's based out of Milwaukee. She's working in conjunction with, um, with folks in Illinois, but um, that is the last one that is happening. So it's at 6.30 central time. Um, and they are going to deploy people into Wisconsin. So I asked her, I said, you know, she's like the front line. What do you, what do you need us to do as far as being in this space? And she said, this is your next best option. You'll be included in the Slack channel after that. And then you'll be deployed to, we need, still need people in Racine, Kenosha and Milwaukee. So close-ish if you're going to travel northwards to be a part of this. And it's so crucial because we've got all of these places that are going to have close margins and we don't know what will happen like and so it's it's about watching those central count locations it's about making sure everyone is 100 feet away from the polling locations all of those very simple things that you we take for granted can determine turnout and and the winning margins in these areas so if you are so inclined and you are confident and comfortable in being i understand that like this is an additional risk right with the pandemic we're going through so just saying that right out but if you are able to um please 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 we are always looking for more volunteers to make sure we are overstaffed rather than understaffed um in these in these locations so i'll be out there maybe i'll see some of you because i'm going down to the milwaukee area um but would love 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 to um have anybody that's willing to be a part of that and then um afterwards <laughs> we also have these narrow thin margin or razor thin margins that um occur in wisconsin and so it's going to be a continued um vigil right that we're holding for democracy um to make sure that every single vote is counted we are um saying we are messaging 
um, and, and using the, that race class narrative um, to say our communities deserve to be heard, right? Like every voice should be um, heard and counted and, and it should matter in this, in this democracy that we um, are a part of. And so it's really, I'm excited because there's a lot of really great players. And so you mentioned Block with Angela. Um, they are a huge part of this effort. Um, and we've got a lot of people out of the Kenosha area that have been organizing throughout the summer. Um, we've got people out of Milwaukee, Madison. So we're connecting all of those dots and we are really trying to be just this like tour de force um, November 4th and beyond should we need it. But um, if you, I'm going to leave after I'm done in the chat, um, just my contact information. If you have any um, like extra time or you're saying I'm good at, you know, we will, we will take any of you. Like <laughs> if you want to be involved in any way, shape or form, when it, whether it's social media amplification, whether it is being in person in Wisconsin and saying that, recognizing we are terrible right now. Um, and experiencing an acute crisis when it comes to the pandemic. Um, but any way that you want to be involved, if you say to me, I've got this skill set, I will find a way to plug you in. Uh, <laughs> and so would love like a million thanks for all of the work that you've done and will continue to do. We still need your help, all hands on deck, right, to make sure that we do not see democracy crumble before our eyes. Um, but we are just so appreciative. I'm happy to answer any questions later on, but I just, I just really want to say thank you so, so much for all the work that y'all done. Thank you, Emily. I just want to say that, you know, the times that I have traveled up there just in the last couple of weeks, um, in the last 10 days have been, I felt very safe. Um, that's the number one thing. If you feel unsafe, you should not stay. Um, and you as an observer are not to go up to any voters anyway. You're there to actually observe and listen, uh, learn as you can and um, keep your distance. I mean, right now here, even in, in Chicago and in Illinois, there, there are shutdowns with our, our, our restaurants, right? But really um, a lot of the, um, the uptick has been happening because of close quarters with people that you know. You know, um, so that's that's the thing for us. This is just another reminder, everybody, just to wear your masks and to social distance, especially when you're around people that you know and you love. <laughs> it's you know the tendency is when you are around people that you're familiar with, you take off your mask. Well, you don't do that when you're at a rally. You don't do that when you're at the polling place. Um, it's not mandated to wear masks, but every place that I've gone to, that everybody has worn a mask. So there's that as well. Um, so um, Emily says all of our poll workers and observers are distributing um, PPE, P PPE, hand sanitizer. Um, and it's gonna be, it has been so steady in all the places that I've gone to, like 500 people a day. Just to, as a reminder, there are over how many polling places? Over 1,600 <laughs> um, uh, election authorities in Wisconsin. And we only, we lost by like 10 votes in every precinct across Wisconsin. So yes. every vote counts, every vote counts. Um, and and the biggest, you know, I, I wanna say uh, hats off to um, Indivisible, Wisconsin, uh, Indivisible Evanston for all the work that you did to register people to vote in Wisconsin these many years, it made a difference because I, I can tell you that there, the lines actually registered to vote take much longer than it does to vote. The lines to vote clip away, but to register to vote takes a minute because of all the um, ID that you need. So if anybody has any questions, please put them into the chat. And, um, and yes, we are not, yes, we're looking, no, we're not looking at the polls. We really don't wanna look at the polls, everybody. We have six days to go. We just need to keep going and keep making those calls. So thank you. Thank you, Emily, for all that you're doing. And thank you, everybody who's done anything in Wisconsin. Rose, thank you, especially. If you don't yes, mind, like, just me just really quickly. I just like want to take, like, I encourage you all to take a moment and just like think about the, the effect and the change that you all have created, like not only in your own state and your own communities, but like north of you, right? Outside of your own community like with people you don't know. And I'm just, I am so grateful to be a part of this moment with you because like Lenny, you mentioned, like we don't wanna depend on polls and I know y'all the work will continue until 8.01 on November 3rd, but really, really like 
it's it's hard to say because we're superstitious and we know that polls don't always tell the truth. But I just like take a moment and just be proud of all the work that you've done, like up until now and the work that you'll continue to do. I'm just I'm so thankful to have this space with you all. So thank you. Thank you, Emily. And then with that, I'm going to pass it to Nick. Nick, are you ready? You have a lot of stuff for us to do, don't you? I feel it. Yeah, I do. So uh, the big thing that I want to start with for tonight, um, we are six days out um, and we are totally anticipating a protect the results scenario. So I have been in touch with practically all of the event hosts at this point. We have 17 protect the results events on the calendar for Illinois, which is great. <laughs> um, a lot of people ready to get in the streets and engage on this. So um, some of you have been in touch with already, but I'm just going to run through some of the updates from national on this. Uh, the, the big thing that we want to check in with everybody that's hosting an event is just really see how things are going with planning so far. Um, at this point, you should have a core group together. The event should be on mobilize if it isn't already um, and uh, starting to reach out to potential coalition partners. So we do have about 110 coalition partners at National. So there are a lot of the groups we work with already, like Move On and SEIU and uh, any other local partner you might have. So definitely get in touch with them and also any like-minded progressive people who share our values that we definitely want to make sure every vote is counted here because um, we know that Republicans will stop at nothing to prevent people from voting, especially if they are in marginalized communities. Um, so those are the planning things. Um, we also are sending packages to people if they registered their event by last weekend. Uh, so some of you may be getting packages in the mail. Uh, those will include masks, hand sanitizer, signs, markers, uh, megaphone, and batteries. Um, if you are not getting a package if you registered your event later, then uh, we do have a budget for all these events. So if you are hosting an event, we can reimburse you up to $500 on items. Uh, chances are you may not need to buy anything at all, especially considering we've been actively protesting for four years at least. <laughs> so if you don't need a sound system or a generator or anything like that, um, then you can just proceed as usual, but know that we do have a budget. Um, if you do need to buy anything, just keep it under $500 and then email me the receipt. Uh, we should be able to get you a check within a week. Um, but just let me know if you're going to buy anything so I can um, make sure it's all good in advance. Um, other stuff we have, uh, we previously said the Protect the Results events were going to be 5 p.m. local time on the 4th. Uh, because of daylight saving time, it will likely be dark at that point. So if you want to move it to any other point in the day, that is fine. Um, but it's totally your call. You can also keep it at 5. It does not matter to us as long as it remains on the 4th. Because um, we want to have mass mobilizations in all parts of the country all on the 4th. Um, so the other unfortunate part that we have to plan for is what to do when far right Nazis show up. <laughs> um, this is not something we like to plan for, but we want to be ready for it. Um, so a lot of you have joined our national trainings on this already. Uh, we've had de-escalation experts come on from Greenpeace and a number of other partner groups who do this work all the time. Um, we know that in a large city like Chicago, we are a definite progressive bubble. Uh, we don't really have a lot of Republican opposition at any of our events. If anything, it's just one loud Trump person in the corner on State Street, <laughs> but uh, they don't really do much there. When we get further out from Chicago, this might become a very real threat, um, and we just have to be ready on how to react here. So if someone shows up armed, I don't expect anybody to become a de-escalation expert in the next week. So this is why the police are involved in this case. Um, just keep in mind, anytime you involve the police, it could become exclusionary for people of color, people that are marginalized, LGBTQ people. I mean, the list goes on. Uh, so just if you're working with any coalition partners, make that decision actively as a team. Do we want to alert the police? Because there's really no need to. Um, you don't necessarily need a permit 
if you're hosting an event like this, um, you don't have to notify the police at all. If anything, it's more of a safety thing. Um, and in larger cities, um, they tend not to provoke. Um, we have seen police actively work against Black Lives Matter all the time. They harass them, they abuse them, they arrest people of color far more likely than anybody on the call right here. Um, so just keep that in mind if you are involving the police in your local event. Um, but if those right-wing agitators do show up, just disengage. You know, th they are not there to engage in dialogue. They are there to make you angry, to get you on camera, to embarrass you. Um, so just pretty much ignore. If they show up with an assault rifle, leave. <laughs> Nobody is forcing you to stay there. Nobody wants you to engage with them. Um, yeah, and Jim puts in the chat, it is illegal to open carry in Illinois. So again, if you do want to alert the police, you see somebody with a gun, that's a 911 situation, get the hell out of there. Um, we don't want anybody to put themselves in harm's way. And we also have to deal with a pandemic. Um, so lots going on there. But for the most part, I don't really think we have a lot of threats in Illinois. We do these actions all the time. Um, I don't think we have to really worry about these concerns, but we just want people to be ready here. Um, so other thing, um, we want Biden to win in a landslide because we don't want to do this. We want this to be so certain on November 4th that Trump has no choice but to concede. So. Uh, in the event that we do have to activate the day of, anybody that's an event host um, has likely gotten an email from me. I will be hosting a planning and strategy call on November 4th at 1 p.m. Uh, because at that point, our national team is going to pretty much chat with all of our 100 plus coalition partners that morning. Uh, we will chat as a team on what we're going to do. And then I want to be able to get that information to you as soon as possible. So if you are an event host, I'm going to put the link in the chat for my call at 1 p.m. It is specifically for anybody in Illinois and Indiana. So don't necessarily share this nationwide, but it is entirely geared for you in this moment. Um, so on that call, we'll talk about um, first, do we need to mobilize at all? Because um, again, if Biden wins every state like Texas and Florida and Wisconsin and Michigan, then there's no path for Trump, you know, and uh, we will make that choice and I'll let you know then. Other thing is how to, um, if there's any last minute updates, anything that we're hearing from swing states that don't have all their ballots counted or anything like that, we want to be able uh, to get that information to people too. Um, so that'll be 1 p.m. next Wednesday the 4th. Um, so if anybody has any other questions for me or um, could use any assistance on anything, just send me an email. That is the best way to get in touch with me lately. Um, I also do have my auto reply on. So if I'm not <laughs> getting uh, a response to you as fast as you would like, you can check the resources in there. I link to every Protect the Results document we have. We have the toolkit, which is very long, but it includes a lot of frequently asked questions. We have a social toolkit within there. Um, there's a set of graphics. There are supplemental materials, uh, the event map itself. And then there's also my resource guide in that auto reply. So if there's anything else that you need, you can check there. Um, but I, I do tend to get back to emails within a day um, now that we are so close to election day. So that is protect the results. I'm going to pause for a second. Does anybody have questions about anything I just said? Nobody. OK, well, I am going to move on to my next piece then. So everybody kind of knows what drum I beat here. <laughs> um, but I just want us all to reflect for the last minute here. Um, so again, None of us here knew each other four years ago, for the most part. Um, we all came to this for different reasons. And over the last four years almost, we've been able to accomplish a ton of stuff. Um, I met Lenny maybe two years ago when I was working for NARAL. And the reason that I got in that fight was because we had a horrible congressperson in Illinois 3 who didn't align with the values of the district, got involved with Marie Newman, started working for NARAL because we had to protect reproductive freedom. At that moment, we had Brett Kavanaugh in the Supreme Court fight. 
And I ended up flying to DC, fighting in that hearing room just to protect women's rights. Um, there was a lot at stake in that nomination. And now with a 6-3 Supreme Court, uh, we have to continue that. But I don't, you don't need to hear from me anymore. You all, you all know pretty much everything about me. <laughs> I want you to type in the chat some of your most proud moments over the last four years, because I know everybody's got them. You all submitted videos for the Midwest Project. <laughs> I want you to tell um, a couple things of uh, that your group has done, whether it was um, electing somebody to Congress or um, defending a law like the ACA, um, but just type it in there. I want to see what everybody's um, what everybody's got going. Oh, Lenny says meeting you all. Yes. <laughs> Flo, flipping the sixth. Yes, and that was an important one. Mm -hmm. Sarah's a great candidates. Pluses for Sean Caston, yes. Mm -hmm. And Lauren Underwood in the 14th. Yep. Mm -hmm. Seems like everybody is unanimous with Sean and Lauren. We, we really do love them here in Illinois. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And beating up Peter Roscom. I, I got to admit that was fun too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Unseating Rauner. Mm hmm. And Kelly with all the buttons. Mm -hmm. Kelly, can you drop the link to your buttons in the chat? Marla, direct action protest in DC with pre existing conditions. Human rights ordinance. Yeah, this is all fabulous stuff. And um, I mean, this is just a quick highlight. Uh, Marie Newman winning her primary. Painting, repainting a building. <laughs> Katie, bye forever, Dan Lipinski. Yep. Um, so just, even just taking a look at the chat right now, we are 26 people from across Illinois and we all have these fabulous stories. So never doubt for a minute that all the work we've done made a difference because think of all these horrible representatives that we got rid of. Nobody was coming to save us. We did the work and we did it. We got rid of Peter Roscom. We got rid of Randy Hulkgren. We're gonna do it more to get rid of bad people like Dan Lipinski in primaries who don't represent our values. We're gonna protect the Affordable Care Act. We're going to uplift immigrant communities. Uh, we are going to actively work toward love and acceptance in our communities because those are all the values that we do share. Um, and we most importantly have to do the work. Um, we know that we have been fighting this fight for four years nonstop. I have protested at Daily Plaza and Federal Plaza more than I can count. <laughs> I have been consistently mad and angry for the last four years. Um, and tweeting about it and you know, arguing with friends and blocking family members on Facebook is not going to solve all of our problems. We have to keep up this fight. Um, many of you know now I'm a marathon runner and I don't pay to run. I just run up and down the blocks in my neighborhood, <laughs> but I still do it. And this is just about mile 20 of the marathon. You know, we can see the end, we're getting tired, we're all burnt out, <laughs> we're getting minimal sleep, but we know the end is so close. Like we can see that finish line, we can see Joe Biden and, and Jill Biden on victory night, <laughs> and we want to get there, but we can't do it without doing the work. Uh, we have to flip the Senate. We have to keep our majority in the House because all of Trump's minions have infiltrated every level of government, including the judiciary, and nobody is going to save us. So we do calls every day that everybody knows about. We play bingo. We have a lot of fun. And we have more prizes now. I have shirts. <laughs> so many of you have also gotten a, a ton of shirts. <laughs> so um, those should all be prizes for people joining our bingo. Um, I have asked every group to co-sponsor a day of bingo. Some, a lot of you are doing it already. Um, we have a lot of opportunities here. Um, so if, if you take a look at some of the links I'm gonna drop in the chat and they're also in the agenda, we are doing our live stream, um, virus-free voting phone bank tomorrow. We'll, we'll be making calls to Alabama for Doug Jones and also Mark Kelly in Arizona other stuff throughout the week. Uh, this weekend is get out the vote. So uh, we are calling swing states. We have Florida on Friday. Uh, we have Michigan on Sunday, South Carolina, 
for the first half on Monday. And then we're making calls for Marie Newman from four to six. And Marie herself will be joining us on Monday night. And then election day, we're doing calls for Pennsylvania and Florida. But the most important thing is our fun Halloween phone bank. <laughs> so please show up in costume. I'm not going to tell you who I am because you all have to join to see who I'm going to be. Um, but it'll be a really good one. I uh, will have Senator Durbin join us. And also Marie will be joining us on Saturday for that too. Um, but we have a ton of uh, great stuff to look forward to. So please engage. And um, I don't really need to do any more convincing, do I? You're all just going to do it, right? <laughs> I mean, Kelly with a maybe. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. <laughs> you misinterpreted my shrug. <laughs> yes, of course, I will be there. And also bring a friend. Mm -hmm. and, and Marcy, the, the Halloween costume is totally optional on Saturday. So if you just want to show up and make calls and do the work, that is fine too. But um, if you want to dress up, that's your call. Um, and yeah, bring a friend too. You know, these are fun banks. We, we really do try to make them as engaging as possible. And um, be doing all this work in a digital space is nothing like we wanted. I mean, my ideal thing would be begging all of you to come knock on doors with me right now in Illinois six, <laughs> but you know, we have to win with the hand we're dealt. So uh, sign up for a phone bank, whether it's with me to flip the Senate and elect Joe Biden or plugging in with a local candidate or doing work on a judicial uh, Supreme court seat. I don't care what it is, as long as everybody's doing the work. Um, we have to be making these calls, connecting with voters one-on-one -on -one and uh, if we don't do it, then we don't want to look forward to next week where we ask what could, what more could we have done? Because um, that's where I was four years ago. I remember how horrible it felt. I made a playlist for Hillary. It was so sad. But uh, we have a real shot this time. And we don't want to trust the polls that says we're up 17 points in Wisconsin and they get, then get comfortable for six days and everybody stays home. We need them to turn in their ballots. We need them to go out and early vote. We need them to vote on election day. And that's exactly what these calls do. They are get out the vote calls. Um, so everybody's got to do the work. So sign up. That's all. That's it. That's it. That's all we got to do. Mm -hmm. I do have one question uh, for those that are left on this call. Oh, Kelly is showing off her buttons. We love the buttons and the stickers. On, uh, on Tuesday, a couple of our members in Indivisible IL-9 were wondering what we all were doing and if there's some kind of a Zoom chat that they could pop into every now and again. It, is anybody organizing something like that on this call by chance? Or is that something that people here might want to have on hand? I don't know how long of a night it's, it's going to be. Lenny, and I know Indivisible sure Evanston is having something. Indivisible Evanston? Yeah, I don't think I see them here. Anyone else? Jim, are you all doing something? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I was just going to check to see if Bill is on. How about you, Lorena? Nothing planned right now. I'm still waiting to hear back if I'm going to be an election judge or not. And they're running a little bit behind here in DuPage. So I'm just waiting for that phone call right now. Mm -hmm. Sarah, what are you thinking? Uh, we're gonna Bill always has coffee and conversation at nine o'clock. That could be expanded. Um, and we've got the WebEx, which we have unlimited, you know, people that could come in on it because it starts at nine o'clock I don't know I don't know we may just be going all all night and who knows how long huh but I, yeah I'll run that by bill and and we could uh see about making this something anybody could just drop in and bring your coffee or whatever we need to drink at that time in the morning but that would be probably nine o'clock on Wednesday. We're talking Wednesday. I mean, I'm thinking Tuesday. somebody was asking about Tuesday, election day. Election day. Yeah. Uh, Sarah Bingaman, did you have yeah, something? We're doing a, a Zoom group 
at 9 p.m. and to watch okay. the results together. And uh, Danny's having one at eight. So we'll be on with Danny at eight and then we're gonna do another one at nine. And we're gonna do top 10. Uh, we're gonna do, we're gonna start with the top 10 most unique things that have happened during this, uh, during this election. Like um, a friend of mine went to a door, we were just dropping literature, but the man invited her in and said, I want you to know why I'm voting for Joe Biden. There is my wife on the mantle, and it was her ashes. She had died of COVID. Oh, <laughs> that was my and this God. was a first time. This was a person who'd gone out for the first time, <laughs> and that was her experience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's so intense. that's that that will be in one of the things in our top 10. And we also have this extremely cute 11 year old who has adopted us. And um, so he's come in like four times for signs. He puts signs out all over the place. We just love this little boy. Uh, David Marquez is his name. You'll be hearing from him in 20 years or so. And uh, he's just really into it. So he's one of our unique things. So we're gonna be talking about our unique things and then we're gonna do a top 10, this is kind of negative maybe, but top 10 stupidest things a Trump supporter has said to you. <laughs> uh, so many. <laughs> so many. We're gonna have go to on really on. narrow it down to the top 10. <laughs> Can I just yeah. start with 10 things the Orland Park mayor has said? <laughs> Well, my neighbor, my neighbor told me the other day that um, Trump was a much better orator than um, Don, that Trump is a much better orator than than Obama. So that that's way up there in that top ten. <laughs> wow, unbelievable! Yeah. Unbelievable! Unbelievable! Yeah. How about you, Marcy? What are you all doing in Champaign? I'll probably be at the Champaign County Democrats office. I've been one of the organizers for um, the whole Champaign County get out the vote, um, you know, um, you know, vote actions since since July, um, and then also I, I've I've also been um, the the volunteer coordinator for the state rep that the the, the person who is running for state rep um, for the Democrats in our district. So I have a feeling I'll probably be at the Dem at the Dems office. I think that's yeah. How about you, Sandy? No plans. Yeah, maybe, maybe we'll have, maybe we'll just, we'll pop in to see what NWSOFA is doing and IL-9 and DuPage. What, what about you, Jean? Do you have anything planned? No, I have no particular um, election day plans. Just uh, see what arises, and uh, probably still planning the uh, following day event. Yeah, I I'm with you though um, too, Nick. In in that I remember four years ago, just feeling like I I didn't even know how to act in front of my kids. They were preteens at the time, and we were just staring in disbelief at the. TV and I, even though I was sitting right next to him, just felt very alone. And I don't want to feel alone. I want to feel the opposite of how I felt four years ago. <laughs> and I want to feel like I can go and celebrate at any time when these things happen, when good news happens. I want to be able to share it. I was not politically active before, so I didn't have this kind of community back then. I, I would, if there was something to celebrate back then, I wouldn't even know who to call because I, you know, I never volunteered. Who I didn't know how to canvas or phone bank, or I didn't know how important it was to talk to, to people. Um, but now well, I could look at Jessica and your wonderful puppy over there. <laughs> <laughs> I will say this, uh, I'm also a member of Indivisible Printers Row, and we have agreed to have a one hour cocktail hour on the night of election night that we will not talk about politics at all. Mm. Nothing, not look at the results or anything so maybe that's an idea for some groups if everybody's afraid of watching the polls well i was going to suggest that, so four years ago um we had invited a bunch of friends over and we had we made a pot of chili of course we expected that hillary was going to win 
And so that was the purpose of, of having people over and watch the returns come in. And it was so devastating. Some of them left early before Michigan got called. I'm from Michigan originally. I said, there's no way Michigan's going to go for Trump, their democratic state. And it, you know, it was, it was really hard. I think what might be helpful is if indivisible, if we could have like a time limited call, maybe a little bit later, even nine o'clock when maybe more results are coming in and we could have maybe a better sense of how things are going. Cause either way, if it's going really great, we're gonna wanna celebrate. And if it's going the other direction, we're gonna probably need support. It'd be, be nice, but I, I guess for me, I don't want it to go on like all night. I'm not one of those people that like to watch things over Zoom, you know, but it would be nice to have an anchor for the evening where we can just be together for an hour or whatever, half an hour, you know, and uh, just kind of check in how things are going. We could, I guess we could arrange that via an email. It, you know, Zoom can be set up pretty quickly, you know. I like, I like the idea of starting at nine, Sandra, and having it at least for an hour. Two. Yeah. Yeah. Etta. Um, am I? Yeah, I'm unmuted. Good. Uh, two years ago, when um, we were going to get the results of the congressional elections, um, I didn't have the heart to watch returns because of how devastating it had been in 2016. So some of my friends, invisible people, uh, we decided to go to a movie and somehow the one that we thought we were going to wasn't at the right time. So we ended up watching Bohemian Rhapsody. And it was absolutely the best thing to watch. So I'm planning on watching Bohemian Rhapsody again uh, on election night. And I have some neighbors who were thinking they have a projector. They were, if it's warm enough and not raining, we're going to have a fire and, you know, we'll be distance and watching uh, that on a screen together because um, I it was just really quite upbeat and I went away feeling great and uh, was happy not to watch returns for a while. Yeah, that sounds like a great plan too. I like that idea as well. I see that Scott has joined us. Scott, thank you for coming on the last Wednesday call before election day. Yes, straight off of work, but excited. I'm um, excited because I see so many people around the state doing such great work. Um, it's really inspiring. Um, you know, the final days, think about how many years ago when we all came together and we were all waiting for this moment, this final moment where people can get out the vote and we can transform this country away from Trump and the hatred. Um, so it's upon us. It's just uh, pretty surreal. And it looks like we're going to win, but we need to be all gas, no brakes, and keep going at it. So I'm um, going to be excited down in Springfield to be hosting the Protect Our Results thing. Um, already got the ACLU, I think, to commit um, and working on other people, but excited to be down in the trenches and we'll see what happens. I believe in this country and I believe that, you know, the people are good. Um, it is really a little bit crazy though with um, us going into the streets and with uh, COVID. So um, you know, people need to be make sure that they're respecting social distances. What are people's plans for that? Because um, that's something that they're asking here in Springfield. So be thinking about that. Um, I would tell you that when the country's at risk, we must at times make decisions that are for the best of the country. Um, so, you know, we, we could be facing that. And if we do, we need to get in the streets and we need to make our voices heard. So just excited to be here to hear everyone that final before the, before the election. So. Absolutely. And, and I, we've just been reflecting all night, Scott, I'm, I'm, you, what, what set this group apart from uh, many groups that I looked into after marching with the women's march is that I liked the, the values that, that we were putting forward, you know, and, and also the autonomy that we had at the grassroots level to set our own mission. And at the state level, we decided that it was important for us to lead with respect, respect for other people, um, to be inclusive and also to lead with nonviolence. And we've, we've, we've um, been 
living those values. We need to continue to do that moving forward. And, um, and as you know, the character is on the ballot. So I'm very, very happy that we're on the same team. Um, and please God, hope that we do not have to do this for another four years. <laughs> we, will, we will work like hell in the next six days to protect the result, right? We will do that. So is there, is there anything else y'all want? One last thing, Lenny. Remember everyone, um, closing, a closing message for fair tax is, it's the billionaires or us. Um, and be thinking these last couple of days of, you know, that you're pushing through social channels, that last push about fair tax, because that issue is what we need in the state of Illinois to do all the things that we all care so deeply about and to make change happen so that JB and the next, next legislature is not hobbled by this pandemic and the collapse of the state government. So fair tax, um, be pushing stuff out through your channels as well. Yeah, thanks, Scott, for that reminder. I did hear that that was you know, if we if we lose fair tax, that we don't know when that is going to be, we're going to be able to have that window again. I mean, we've been fighting for this since the '70s, I think. So <laughs> we need to we need to pass it this year. We need there's so much money going into opposing the fair tax, um, and you see all those commercials. So yeah, please, 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 everybody, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, take care of that puppy, Jessica. I've been loving. Loving him. What's his name? Her? Skippy. And I don't know why, but he really does want to be up here for the Zoom calls. So he keeps wanting to jump up here. He likes being up here with everyone. So <laughs> Scott knows Skippy. <laughs> well, we are enjoying Skippy very much. Before we go, can we do a group screenshot for everybody? Yeah. So if everybody wants to turn their videos on and then hold up their vote buttons, stickers, anything you got around.